Hi, Steve here with the second and final part of my video report on our YouTube and Skype hosted virtual 30 Years War war game using, or abusing, the new Indeo Veritas rules from Helion Publishing. I say abusing as, having reread the rules since posting the first video, we got more wrong than right and this report cannot be taken as a valid endorsement or otherwise of the rule set. More of flavour. Chilli, rhubarb with marmite flavour, perhaps. Turn 2 commenced with Paul trying to follow up on his initial success with his right flank cavalry wing. He pursued the routing Frenchman, then manoeuvred some of his other cavalry squadrons, um, sorry, brigades, into supporting positions for the brigade in melee. Here the game was affected by another major mistake I made and no one picked up on. I assumed that cavalry have no shooting capability. Wrong, of course they do. Had Paul known this, he would doubtless have behaved differently. In the centre, the Bavarian infantry continued their steadfast if unimaginative, advance. On Nigel's wing, the Bavarian left flank cavalry considered how to deal with Sean's trap. The French cavalry were outnumbered four to one, and it should have been an easy task for Nigel to brush them aside and sweep around the flank of the French position on the hill. Nigel, however, couldn't keep his attention away from Sean's infantry brigades, who would have half of Nigel's wing in musketry range for at least two turns. Sean had an infantry brigade in reserve, and it was obvious that he hoped to seriously disrupt Nigel's cavalry by fire before swinging the reserves into a refused position to block any further Bavarian progress. In the end, Nigel decided to square up against Sean's flanking infantry brigade to at least hold their attention and keep their musketry away from his two attacking brigades. He also attached his wing commander to the cavalry squad uh, brigade that he intended to assault with. Along with his secure flank, this would make it highly likely that the cavalry squadron brigade would pass the test necessary to close to contact next turn. The Bavarian turn concluded with John straightening his reserve infantry line and the ball passed back to the French. On Dave's wing, the left flank cavalry wished to counter Paul's breakthrough by moving unengaged units towards the fight. If you, as we have been, are used to the free and easy movement of black powder and its derivatives, Indeo Veritas comes as a bit of a shock. A brigade takes half a move to perform any turning manoeuvre. Thus, Dave could turn his cavalry and move towards the action, but then couldn't turn back to face Paul's brigades and was left with hanging flanks. Sean declined to move and we entered the combat phase. Nigel took his test and passed, meaning his cavalry, with commander attached, moved into close combat with Sean's brigade. There followed some desultory shooting from both sides down the line. Some unsaved hits were inflicted, leading to disorder, which is the first state of reduced cohesion, but no disruption, which is the second state. The third state of reduced cohesion is rout, and it is when brigades rout that the general morale of wings, and then the army as a whole, becomes threatened. We then moved on to resolving melees. Again, we had misread the rules and had rolled for initiative at the start of the turn. In fact, now is the point where initiative is rolled for, simply to give one player the advantage of choosing the order of melee resolution. We started with the ongoing combat between Paul and Dave. This time, Dave scored one unsaved hit to Paul's none, and Paul's brigade, 
losing by one, was forced to retire. The recoiling brigade moves a full move, except when, as in this instance, it contacts friendly troops. In this case, the recoiling unit moves beyond the friends and stops there, and the friendly unit's cohesion deteriorates by one level. So here, Paul's rear support brigade, which was sound, becomes disordered. A chance for Dave? However, as Dave's cavalry had not routed Paul's, he cannot test for impetuous pursuit, and has to content himself with taking the ground previously occupied by Paul's brigade. On the opposite flank, the fight between Nigel and Sean's cavalry was a draw, and so continued into the next turn. The combat phase complete, we entered the morale phase. First, brigades with some degree of diminished cohesion could attempt to improve themselves by rallying. Once this was complete, any wings containing routed or destroyed brigades test for fatigue. Finally, if an army has one or more fatigued wings, it must test its general will to continue. This was where we almost came a cropper at an embarrassingly early stage. Dave's cavalry wing did not rally its routers and rolled as badly as possible on the fatigue test. Having a fatigued wing, he rolled on the general will test and rolled almost as badly. We were about to abandon the game in despair when I reread the rules and remembered that we had rated both Turenne and Von Mercy as very experienced strong-willed commanders. The positive factors this rating applied to the test meant that the French were bucked up and ready to continue. Phew! The next turn commenced with Dave's cavalry making a series of charges into Paul's brigades. He passed his test to close with the front of the brigade that had been disordered by recoiling friends, then made a succession of flank charges which did not require a test to close as a brigade's control zone extends only to its front. We were all a little surprised that the target of the charges could neither attempt to turn to face nor evade. On the Bavarian left, Nigel contented himself with moving a cavalry brigade onto the flank of the ongoing combat to offer such support as it might. The Bavarian infantry lines started to fragment as the brigades moved to take advantage of a large gap between the two French wings. Note the pointless movement of the Bavarian Reserve Cavalry along its baseline, which was to be a feature of the game. The game now progressed along what were becoming familiar lines. Notwithstanding the degree to which we were getting lots of rules wrong, In Deo Veritas was proving to be very easy to pick up and absorb, which must be a good thing. Shooting took place along the lines, then combat was resolved, first on one cavalry wing and then the other. On Day and Paul's wing, one of Day's flank charges won big, with Paul's brigade being destroyed outright. The second was a draw, which resulted in Paul's brigade being allowed to turn to face. The third, where Dave had charged downhill into Paul's disordered brigade, proved disastrous for Dave, with his brigade routing through and disordering his reserve brigade behind. By now, Paul was tearing his hair out about the impetuous pursuit rule, as he couldn't pursue, even though he had the flank of a disordered enemy brigade right in his front. On 
the opposite wing, Nigel's cavalry beat Sean's, but only by a single casualty, and so Sean fell back, with Nigel unable to pursue and occupying the ground instead. After attempting to rally disordered, disrupted and routed brigades, both sides checked for fatigue, and Dave's cavalry wing, with two routed brigades, failed the test. Dave rolled well on the general will table, however, and the game continued. The game continued, in fact, in the same vein for another three turns. The cavalry fight between Sean and Nigel remained inconclusive as Nigel continued to hold back his reserves for fear of Sean's infantry. The Dave-Paul imbroglio continued in sporadic fashion as the inability of victorious cavalry brigades to exploit their advantage prevented decisive movement. The Bavarian infantry gradually and painfully developed their position, bringing more fire onto Sean's infantry brigades and Dave's cavalry brigades, until, finally, the inevitable happened, and Dave failed a general will test, meaning that the French army had to withdraw from the field. At the post-game post-mortem, opinions over In Deo Veritas were very mixed. First, we should probably state our gaming context. We are a group of eight or ten veteran wargamers who enjoy large games with large numbers of predominantly 28mm figures. We normally play over a full day and there are usually three or four players on each side. We have little or no interest in competition gaming and some of us care very little about whether we win or lose, so long as we feel that the process was authentic. Authentic as we understand it, of course. We look for rules that create games that allow full participation of all players, that can cope with very large armies without abstracting so much detail that the period flavour disappears, and that can give a result in six or eight hours gaming. In addition, given the current plague conditions, the rules have to be lean and easily memorable so that the game master, umpire, general factotum can keep everything moving quickly enough to keep the remote player's attention from wandering. Indeo Veritas scored strongly on several of these points. All of the players were involved in every turn, and, after early hiccups, there was rarely a need to refer to anything other than the quick reference sheet. The result was not in doubt from about turn three, and I can't imagine that many games would peter out into a tedious draw. What we didn't take to was the degree to which this was achieved by process abstraction. The reduction of all infantry units of all periods and nationalities to the ubiquitous brigade means that any interest in comparing doctrines is absent. Why did Morris's Dutchman stun the Spaniards and change the makeup of an infantry force overnight? Why did Gustavus Adolphus evolve that to the Swedish brigade and how did the Catholic armies ultimately counter that? These are the sorts of things that interest us and cannot really be illustrated within a game of Indeo Veritas. Also, the difference between cavalry and infantry in this game is one of degree. Cavalry brigades are essentially infantry brigades that move faster and shoot less. Using the same combat resolution mechanisms and behaviours for cavalry as for infantry is what we suspect led us to have so much frustration with cavalry fights. As a postscript, we agreed to give Indeo Veritas another run out the following week, and chose one of our favourites, Nerdlingen. We were very fortunate and privileged to be joined for the first couple of hours by the author of Indeo Veritas, Phil Garton, who kindly Skyped in at my request. He made the very valid point that the game was not designed with our gaming style in mind, but rather to allow two players to reenact full battles of the period in a single club outing of two or three hours. This was universally accepted, and we were gratified to hear that he accepted our quibbles about cavalry impetuous pursuit and told us that he would revise the rules such that victorious cavalry units always tested for pursuit. 
Nordlingen, the game was not completed in the day's gaming, but that may well have been due to the amount of conversation that took place whilst Phil was in attendance. In summary, I think that In Deo Veritas serves its designed purpose very well and will have a long and prosperous life as a club set of 17th century rules. For our own gaming group, the search for a set of 17th century rules that meets our particular criteria continues. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you again soon. All the best, Steve.